<laughs> All right. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Feels good to be back up here. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then I'll move to your questions. Uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson will travel to Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, and China March 15th through 19th, uh, his first visit as Secretary of State to uh, the East Asia and Pacific region. In each country, uh, Secretary will meet with senior officials to discuss bilateral and multilateral issues, including uh, strategic coordination to address the advancing nuclear and missile threat from North Korea. Obviously, given North Korea's uh, continuing provocative uh, behavior and actions, uh, the U.S. is actively engaged uh, with its partners and allies in the region to uh, address the threat uh, posed by North Korea's weapons programs. Uh, Secretary Tillerson will also seek to reaffirm the administration's commitment uh, to further broaden and enhance U.S. economic and security interests in the Asia-Pacific region. Asia is, uh, of course, a key engine of economic growth and dynamism uh, that the U.S. believes is crucial to the growth of its own economy. Uh, this administration is also intent on pursuing a constructive relationship with China. Uh, Secretary Tillerson has already met with uh, China's state counselor as well as its foreign minister. Uh, while remaining determined to ensuring that China abides by its uh, by international rules and plays fair with respect to trade, uh, regional issues, and of course human rights. Uh, also wanted to add that the State, state Department welcomed the visit uh, to Washington yesterday by uh, UN Special Advisor uh, to the Secretary General in Cyprus, Espen Barth, Barth uh, Ede, uh, to Washington. Uh, Under Secretary for Political Affairs Tom Shannon uh, met with Special Advisor Ide yesterday to and reaffirm strong U.S. support for the Special Advisor and Cypriot-led U.N. facilitated process to reunify the island as a bisonal, bicommunal federation. Uh, based on the considerable progress made by the Cypriot leaders, we believe this is the best chance in decades to achieve a lasting and comprehensive solution and hope the leaders will return as soon as possible uh, to, the to the negotiating table. The United States remains prepared to offer any assistance that the leaders would consider useful. With that, over to you, Matt. Thanks, Mark, yep. and uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome back. This, <laughs> as you know, well know, is a very important venue for not only foreign governments, but foreign publics, the American people, and the men and women who work here and in embassies abroad. They all look to this briefing. They take their cues from it and try to figure out what's going on with, or hopefully that you explain what's going on with foreign policy. So going forward, I hope that you will expect the same kind of questions that you were getting in previous administrations, and we will expect the same kind of fulsome <laughs> answers. I appreciate that. Even I'm using the word fulsome wrong. I want to go through, I know that there's a lot of uh, new administration reviews, a lot of policies, a lot of things that work in of progress. And so I just want to start with, uh, very briefly, with a couple of things that have already happened. Okay. One is, um, in the last day of the Obama administration, um, Secretary Kerry notified Congress that, that you were going to uh, ignore some holes on aid to the Palestinians, $221 million. That was on the January 20th. On Monday, that was the Friday, so on Monday, the first full day of the new administration, this building said that that money was now being reviewed. Um, I'm wondering, one, what the status of that review is, but also, two, why it is that this building, in saying it was going to review it, said the money was, in fact, $220 million for Gaza recovery programs, when that differs with what the Congress was notified. Well, Matt, uh, as always, you've stumped me right out of the box because I don't have a status update uh, on that, uh, that assistance. Uh, with respect to the discrepancy in numbers, I'll also have to take that and get back to you. Second thing, um, yep. the <clears throat> one of the first things that the president did was to sign the, an executive order reinstituting the Mexico City language Correct. for family planning programs. Um, it, the White House, in explaining this, said that this would prevent the U.S. taxpayer dollars from funding abortion uh, or promotion of abortion overseas. I'm curious how much money over the previous administration, the eight years of the Obama administration, when the Mexico City language wasn't in place, how, how much money was spent uh, on abortion or pr uh, promoting abortion? 
how much money specifically broken out. I don't have that figure. Um, but yes, it is a fact against the law, is it not? Existing law for U.S. taxpayer dollars to be spent. To be spent for a, abortion. Well, so, that's a, again, we're implementing the EO uh, that was passed. Yeah, but it wasn't it already being. I mean, I'm asking if it was necessary to to do this since it's already illegal for taxpayer money. Taxpayer, uh, again, it's, been illegal, uh, it's been illegal for decades. Well, it's so, illegal to use the to money use for the abortion, money. but not for organizations that right. also provide right. Which is abortion. what the Mexico City is. Right. Well, the argument that previous administrations have made in support of this is that the question of fungibility, where money can be used for different purposes and frees up other money. So I'm wondering, considering that this is an important issue for the administration, what the what your studies have shown the amount of money that fungible money is that will be stopped from by by this work again i'll have to get back to it on a specific right, breakdown thing, on the executive order that was signed yesterday but which we all had a preview of uh the immigration and refugee executive order yep. um since you knew that this was coming and everyone everyone basically knew it was coming since the first one came out um, it calls for a review of the vetting procedures for not just refugees, but also on the terms of uh, visa, uh, visa issuance. I'm wondering, since that review must be well along now, what deficiencies the reviewers have uncovered in the previous, or prior, or, or even current vetting process? Sure. Well, I mean, look, um, it, and this is elaborated in Section 5 of the Executive Order. Uh, but it does call for the development of uh, a uniform baseline uh, for screening and vetting standards uh, and procedures. Uh, and it also, as you noted, calls for progress reporting uh, to the President beginning 60 days after the implementation uh, date, which is March 16th. Uh, that said, uh, some of this work was uh, already underway from the uh, 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 previous EO. Um, I, I can't get into too many specific details about what this report has uncovered thus far. Uh, we spoke with, and frankly, Secretary Tillerson spoke in respect to uh, 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 some of the uh, uh, progress that Iraq has made uh, uh, with regard to uh, meeting some of the questions or some of the um, uh, uh, disconnects, uh, if you will, in terms of information sharing and other uh, uh, procedures, uh, that they've met those requirements. Uh, one of the reasons why, why uh, Iraq was removed uh, from the list of seven countries. Uh, but this is all part of the executive order's uh, uh, purpose, which is to review and improve our national, secure, national security focused uh, visitor screening uh, and vetting procedures. Uh, and the process, as I said, is ongoing. So there hasn't been any specific improvement uh, so far? Made. Well, again, I mean, we're always seeking to improve what we're doing. Uh, and, and this is an iterative process. I mean, even before the executive order, we can say that, you know, uh, it's not like uh, we just began this uh, January 27th, but I think it was a renewed commitment to look at uh, the procedures with how we vet uh, both refugees incoming as well as uh, immigrants, or rather uh, traveling uh, public, uh, into this country uh, to ensure that uh, we're doing uh, the necessary to uh, provide for the security of Americans. That suggests that the, that the necessary wasn't being done prior. Is that correct? Not at all. And I think the Secretary spoke to this yesterday when he said that this is, you know, it, it, it's almost impossible, and I'm paraphrasing him, for this to be infallible, uh, this process. But we always have to strive to do so. And I think past administrations have done so as well. But I think the President clearly identified this as a security issue when he came into office. And now we uh, reissued the executive order yesterday, or issued a new executive order uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that uh, this is an ongoing process. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Andrew. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Uh China has today warned that there will be consequences both for the United States and for South Korea uh, from the initial stages of deployment of missile defense in South Korea. Can you respond to that? And then I want to ask you about the North Korean test and um, what the vulnerabilities are. Sure. Um, I mean, in terms of – you want me to respond directly to, uh, to uh, some of China's – yeah. Uh, of course. Um, Look, I think we've been very clear uh, that uh, THAAD, which is what they're referring to, is clearly a defensive uh, system. Uh, and uh, the reason we're pursuing this uh, implementation or deployment of THAAD uh, with South Korea is because of uh, North Korea's continued 
for lack of a better term, bad behavior, uh, that they continue to uh, carry out uh, exercises or uh, rather tests uh, that, frankly, uh, not only threaten the uh, stability of the Korean Peninsula, but the region and even the national security of the United States of America. Uh, so this is not something that, as obviously we made the decision in the past week or so, this has been months uh, in, in the works, uh, and, uh, and the next stage is moving forward. And for the specifics on that deployment of the THAAD uh, system, I refer you to the Department of Defense. But uh, we've been very clear in our conversations with China uh, that uh, this is not meant to uh, be a threat and is not a threat uh, to them or any other. Uh, power in the region. It is a defensive system, and it is in place, or it will be in place, because of uh, North Korea's provocative behavior. Now, David Sanger and his colleagues at the New York Times have reported over the weekend that among the options being considered are helping South Korea uh, get a nuclear defensive weapon or a nuclear weapon. Uh, is that one of the options being considered, and how would that make the peninsula safer? Well, again, I don't want to. Uh, uh, I certainly don't want to get into uh, uh, those kinds of conversations uh, that we might be having in terms of uh, some of the things that are outlaid in that or laid out in that article. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I wouldn't say that's something that we're actively pursuing. What we're f focused on right now is strengthening uh, our defensive uh, exercises, our defensive cooperation uh, with South Korea, uh, so that they can defend themselves against continued uh, North Korean aggression. Finally, there has been criticism today on the Hill, as there has been in the past weeks from other venues, that this department has been silent in the face of a number of threats uh, in Ukraine and North Korea, elsewhere from other adversaries, that the State Department has not had a voice, uh, both from the podium and hearing from the secretary. Mm -hmm. um, is diplomacy taking a second seat or back seat in the National Security Council, and what is the Department's response to the outlined budget cuts, which would be as deep as 37 percent in terms of diplomacy and USAID development overseas? Sure. Uh, it's a big question, but I'll try to answer it. Um, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, with respect to uh, the State Department's voice, um, first of all, I'm glad that we're back up at the podium. Um, many of you know that I've been in this uh, job for uh, a number of years, uh, so obviously I respect uh, uh, what this briefing is about and what it accomplishes. Uh, and uh, 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 of course, uh, I appreciate uh, the patience of all of you over the past uh, month or so as this new administration uh, got its sea legs underneath it. Uh, and we're able to come back out here and brief to the public, because we do take this very seriously, I can assure you. Um, with respect to the State Department's voice in this new administration, I can also assure you that Secretary Tillerson is very engaged with the White House, uh, very engaged with the President, uh, speaks to him frequently, uh, was over there, I believe, just yesterday uh, for a meeting. Um, and I can assure everyone that uh, the Secretary's voice, uh, or the State Department's voice is heard loud and clear in policy discussions uh, at the National Security uh, Council level. Um, the Secretary himself has been hard at work uh, uh, and focused on, I think, in his early days in establishing the, the relationships that he feels uh, are absolutely vital uh, with his key counterparts. Uh, he was at the G20. Uh, he held, I think, some 14 bilateral meetings and I think uh, three multilateral meetings. Uh, including one with the uh, Republic of Korea uh, and Japan uh, to talk about uh, North Korea's continued uh, threat to the region's stability. He also met with Foreign Minister Lavrov there. He met with uh, Foreign Minister Yang, uh, Wang rather, from, uh, or uh, Yang from uh, China, uh, and uh, at the same time held meetings on Yemen and Syria. Uh, again, I think he's working hard at establishing uh, the connections that he needs to have in order to be an effective Secretary of State uh, with key counterparts, with key partners, and with key allies. He also went to Mexico, uh, had a very successful visit there along with uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, John Kelly. Uh, again, it was productive. Uh, it laid out a very forward-looking uh, agenda for U.S.-Mexico relations. Uh, and it was, I think, uh, uh, 
a recognition of how vital that particular relationship is, that bilateral relationship is to the United States um, and to the prosperity and security of both our countries. And now next week he'll be going to Asia, uh, again visiting in, with uh, China, or visiting in China rather, uh, then going to uh, South Korea as well as Japan. These are important visits, they're important trips, they're important meetings uh, that he's having. I think, again, to just uh, establish uh, the relationships that he needs to have to be an effective Secretary of State. Uh, I think going forward, uh, you know, he'll uh, be clarifying his priorities uh, as his Secretary. And your last question, sorry to address it, I was going through my head, but you talked sorry, about the budget. About That's the budget. Okay. Will he be fighting for the State Department for diplomacy for this workforce? So and the short you know, answer, to, yeah, yeah, of course. The short answer to that is, um, you know, he, the budget process is still, as you well know, is in early days. <laughs> um, this is going to be a process that's going to play out in the weeks and even months ahead. Um, but uh, I, what I can say is that uh, he has been working with uh, senior staff uh, here at the State Department, listening to what their priorities are, what they're working on what they believe is going well, where they believe they have needs that need to be addressed. Uh, and uh, he is working to ensure that this department, and most importantly, our missions abroad, have the resources and personnel uh, they need to fully carry out their missions. And I think that's where his focus is on. Yeah, at least. Or, no, no, I, I just want to echo what um, Matt and Andrea said, and I'm glad that you said in your opening remarks that you respect the briefing process and hope that you will continue it regularly, not just as a tool of American leadership, but also in transparency to the American people that the Secretary promised on his first day um, to employees. Um, if you could, I just want to follow up on the budget sure. um, issue. You said that the Secretary is working with senior staff to determine what their needs are and to make sure that the uh, building and the missions overseas have the resources um, that they need. With the reported budget cuts of up to 37 percent of this State Department, which is more than a third of the budget, um, what would be the practical effect um, of the State Department operations, including um, the dr dramatic cuts of foreign aid? And what do you think um, would be the effect of U.S. leadership overseas? Sure. Um, look, uh, and I'm aware of all the various uh, uh, numbers that are circulating out there with respect to uh, uh, proposed budget cuts, uh, not only to state but to, well, but to other. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, again, I would just stress that this is still very early on in the process. And I think what's important, well, that's important, first of all, to stress that. Um, I would also stress that uh, Secretary Tillerson understands the vital work that this department does. He understands the hard work of our embassies and our embassy personnel, our diplomats, uh, our foreign service and civil service personnel here in Washington, but also, as I said, overseas, um, and wants to make sure, um, as their leader, uh, as a former CEO, but now directing the foreign policy of the United States, uh, that uh, his team, his staff, are properly resourced. And I think that's his mindset going into the budget process, is how do I make sure that they have what they need to get the job done. Now, that being said, I think there's also a period, as with any transition, of reassessment. It's one of the reasons why he's meeting and talking to senior staff, talking to uh, various leadership at different levels to try to get their feedback on what they believe uh, are their priorities and how we can reconf reconfigure and look at resources. Um, that's part of what he's been doing the past several weeks. Uh, I don't have m many specifics to add, but of course, as we go forward, um, that's something that he's going to be looking at. Given, yeah, the fact that, given the fact that several of his predecessors across party lines, um, secretaries of defense, members of Congress, up until this point with yep. the existing budget that you've been working on, this continuing resolution, have said that the State Department is under-resourced, how does the secretary um, fathom that the State Department could be properly resourced? with up to more than a third of cuts if it wasn't resort, properly resourced. I understand that there's a reassessment that he'll want right. to make and, 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 and make again, reforms would, and changes, right. but those those numbers seem right. wildly and again, I would, disparate. Sorry, I'm going to talk over you. Um, and, and again, I would be cautious to say that that um, th that preliminary number that's floating out there is where we're going to end up. I think what his goal, what senior staff's goal here at the State Department is, is to say, okay, where can we possibly uh, uh, 
move resources to, reevaluate resource, resources, reassess, uh, perhaps make cuts um, uh, if that's, uh, we feel that's uh, necessary, um, but in no way trying to limit uh, the function or the uh, efficacy, uh, efficiency of the State Department. Um, and I think that's always, uh, you know, foremost in, uh, certainly in his mind uh, in these early days. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, we've seen the letters, we've seen the public uh, statements by many uh, former leaders, uh, military and uh, obviously sec former secretaries of state uh, uh, with regard to the um, value of foreign assistance. And I think we recognize um, the value of foreign assistance. Um, Again, though, I think at the beginning of a new administration, it's a chance and it's an opportunity to look at um, who receives foreign assistance, how much they receive, whether that much is still needed, and again, just reassess uh, how we're spending uh, American taxpayer dollars. Um, just one, one last of one course, um, and as get, a follow-up yeah, yeah. to Matt's question um, on the EO. Yesterday, um, Secretary Kelly said that there were 14, or maybe it was this morning, I it's okay. time is a continuum right now, <laughs> um, that um, f about 14 other countries don't have, that or have questionable or in insufficient vetting processes. Is the Secretary in touch with the leaders or his counterparts in these 14 other countries and um, about strengthening those type of vetting? And is another executive order or, a, or amendment adding some of those countries in consideration. Right. So my understanding on this is that that's part of this, this vetting um, review that we're looking at is how to identify um, uh, and get a clear understanding of uh, um, where there are gaps, where there are deficiencies in the vetting process, and between, as I said, which countries uh, that involves. Uh, so that's going to be part of the process going forward in these coming uh, uh, um, uh, uh, period, uh, which is to reevaluate uh, where we can do better and where we need additional information. And then, of course, we will address those shortcomings with uh, the governments of concern. Mark, 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 a question about Mark. the um, Middle East peace policies. Yep. Um, can you clarify sure, what the policy on settlements is? Has it changed? Are settlements still an obstacle to peace, or is there some nuance there now? And secondly, the um, President has named Jared Kushner as his envoy to make Middle East peace. Um, what sort of connection does his role have with the State Department? Aside from Secretary Tillerson calling him and chatting, is there any sort of channel with the experts here at the State Department who have been very much involved um, in, uh, in previous um, efforts to have some sort of Israel-Palestinian negotiations? Sure. Uh, first of all, in settlements, I think the President uh, spoke about this, uh, um, I guess, a couple weeks ago, uh, where he said he would like to see Israel hold back on settlement activity. Um, and I think that we're in discussions um, with Israel about what exactly that would look like. Um, but uh, I think uh, with respect to how any settlement activity might affect the overall climate uh, for uh, an eventual solution uh, between the, the two parties, I think that's under consideration. Uh, and uh, it's in that regard that he made those comments. Uh, with respect to uh, the connection or how the uh, State Department uh, uh, may be playing a role in uh, the pursuit of Middle East peace, uh, I know that uh, um, uh, uh, we are uh, working closely with uh, the White House uh, on uh, evaluating where we stand. I think at this point we're still kind of uh, at a stage where we're looking at uh, the situation uh, and trying to formulate uh, next steps. Uh, but I can assure you that the State Department is playing a role in that process. Staying on the same topic, yes, Mark. Yeah. Well, good to see you. Good to see you too. Back there. We missed you. Yep. Uh, anyway, uh, a couple of things uh, on this uh, issue. First of all, could you clarify the United States position on being a member of the, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council? Because there was a bit of confusion, uh, apparently, uh, Secretary Tillerson said that he's looking into, uh, according to political, looking into the value of U.S. membership in this council. Could you clarify that? On, uh, sorry, you're talking about on with respect to the Human Rights Council. Right. right. Well, I, what I can say is that uh, is that the, uh, uh, the I think the the Human Rights Council is meeting. I think it's it continues its work until uh, late March. Mm -hmm. uh, we're there. Uh, we're a part of that process. Uh, we're bringing an agenda, and we're hard at work uh, on the ground. 
Uh, so as to any rumors that may have been circulating out there, uh, I think they're just that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a couple more. And yep. now, uh, the second sorry, March 24th, I think. Sorry, I apologize. I just found the date here. Uh, I think uh, the Human Rights Council is supposed to go until March 24th. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, uh, we're there. We're at the table. Uh, we're working uh, on an agenda. Uh, um, we've been elected to a three-year term, I think, back in 2016. And uh, we're committed to um, human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, and working uh, to pursue those. Now, Please go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Secretary Tellison also, uh, you know, hosted uh, the Israeli Prime Minister for dinner here on the 14th of, of uh, February last, last month. Uh, has he been in touch with any Palestinian leaders? Are there any plans to meet with any Palestinian leaders? I know he's planning to meet with uh, the, the Israeli Defense Minister Lieberman you know, in the near future. I apologize. You're referring to Secretary Tillerson. Secretary not Tillerson. To the, yeah. yeah. Um, I am not aware uh, of any meetings uh, in the immediate future, but. Uh, uh, in a conversation with any of the Palestinian leadership? Uh, I'm not aware of that. He has been. I'll, I'll check on that. Sorry. Okay. Yep, please. Uh, but I can assure you that, obviously, Michael Ratney, who I believe is uh, is taking over that portfolio uh, in this administration, is uh, within uh, the Bureau of Middle Eastern Affairs, or Near Eastern Affairs, rather, uh, is in touch with uh, uh, Palestinian leaders. He's being, he's, so he's, he's not doing Syria anymore? He's doing both. He's doing both? Yes. Oh, good, because that's not too much of for one person, is it? <laughs> He's a dynamo. He is. A, he is a, Let's go here and okay. we'll work back. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I know that the U.S. Position, I'm sorry, where are we? Thad. Oh, Thad. Thank you. So, I mean, I know the U.S. position has always been that it's a defensive system and the decision to, to start this uh, deployment, uh, you know, was under the Obama administration. Since the second, right? The, uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, since the secretary is about to walk into the teeth of this uh, in, in, in Asia next week, like what more can you do, can the United States do, to, to make that position uh, more saleable to the Chinese? Sure. I mean, they're looking at the radar, and the radar looks into their country. Why wouldn't they be concerned? Well, uh, again, um, you know, just to unpack this, uh, China uh, – is well aware of not just our concerns. China, in fact, shares our concerns about uh, North Korea's uh, um, uh, unlawful weapons programs and the fact that they, uh, as I said, represent a clear uh, and very grave threat to the peninsula, to the region, and, and as well as to the United States. Um, I mean, North Korea openly states that its ballistic missiles are intended to deliver nuclear weapons uh, to strike cities in the United States and the Republic of Korea and Japan. Uh, so it's in that context that we uh, are in conversations and discussions with China. We've been very clear that uh, the decision to uh, deploy THAAD uh, is as a defensive measure in order to protect not only uh, South Korean, but also our military uh, who are stationed in South Korea. Um, I think where we all have to focus on going forward, and I think the central focus of Secretary Tillerson's trip to the region should not be on the deployment of threat, THAAD, which is, frankly, uh, a response to the threat. It's the threat itself, the threat that North Korea uh, continues to pose and has, frankly, only uh, uh, augmented. Uh, in the past uh, uh, year to six months, uh, and how do we address that threat? And I think we're looking at uh, new initiatives, new ways uh, uh, to address it. Um, I also think that, uh, I know that, uh, we're pressing for increased uh, implementation of an already very stringent uh, sanctions regime. But as we all know, and I've said many times, sanctions are only as good as uh, how well they're implemented. Uh, and so until we have full implementation of the sanctions, uh, we're not going to have be able to apply the pressure that we feel needs to be brought to bear on North Korea. And you've seen China uh, in, in recent days take some uh, steps with respect to coal imports uh, uh, that reinforce or enforce those sanctions in greater, uh, in greater detail. Does that include new sanctions? Let's go. Yeah, Michelle, go ahead. 
Mark, okay, what's, to what's the U.S. position towards uh, the situation in Manbij in Syria? Uh, the American flag is flying there. There are more American troops in the area. And uh, uh, Turkey is threatening to enter the city, and the regime is preparing uh, to, to, enter, to, to go to the city, too. Sure. Well, I, I believe the, the Pentagon's already spoken to this in some um, tactical detail. And I would also I would encourage you to speak to them uh, directly about uh, these kinds of movements on the ground. I, I think, l broadly speaking, uh, of course, it's a very complex environment uh, uh, around uh, the area east of El Bab. Um, it's a place where multiple forces, frankly, have converged, uh, all with the intent to uh, drive out ISIS. Um, but I think when you've got multiple uh, forces in such a small, confined space, um, we want to avoid any unnecessary or unintended escalation uh, in what is already a very uh, tense uh, and dynamic uh, situation. Uh, so we are uh, sending a message uh, to all forces uh, that are there on the ground to remain focused on the counter-ISIS fight and concentrate their efforts on defeating ISIS and not uh, towards other objectives that may detract from the coalition's ongoing campaign. Uh, so we want to keep the focus on uh, the stated intent to uh, destroy uh, ISIS. Uh, the coalition is going to continue to work in close co uh, coordination with allies and partner forces, uh, again, with the uh, focus on um, defeating uh, what is a common enemy, which is ISIS. Uh, one more on this, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, U.S., Russia, and Turkish uh, uh, chief of staffs have met in Antalya today, and they will continue meeting. Uh, is there a new coordination between the U.S. and Russia on the fight uh, against ISIS and uh, on the situation in Syria? Right. You're talking about a meeting today, um, not sure, uh, what the date was, but uh, between Joint Chiefs of Staff General uh, Dunford, uh, and he met with uh, Chief of Russian General Staff. Russian general staff, uh, as well as the chief of the Turkish general staff. Um, the purpose of the meeting, as I understand it, is to enhance senior level military communications and improve operational deconfliction of our respective military operations in Syria. I'd refer you to DOD for any details, but uh, my understanding of this is that it's, it remains focused on deconflicting. Chief, just two quick ones. One on the Iraq EO. Yesterday, when Secretary Tillerson spoke, he said, suggested that Iraq came off the list because it was partnering with the U.S. And you mentioned this in in the vetting process. Um, prior to that, Iraq was extremely angry about being on this list, and there was some concern that its partnership with the U.S. and the fight against ISIS might be jeopardized by its appearance on the list. So, is is are you saying that? Iraq is taken off this list only because of the vetting process or because there were concerns that its partnership with the U.S. in the fight against ISIS would be jeopardized? Well, um, I, I think both, but I think you can't have, you know, obviously we would not have just lifted them uh, out of this uh, group uh, if we were not uh, convinced and satisfied uh, that they were uh, taking steps to address our concerns uh, with regard to uh, the vetting of, uh, of individuals and, and willing to uh, take measures. Uh, um, to achieve, um, frankly, our shared objective, which is to uh, prevent uh, anyone with criminal or terrorist intent to uh, uh, reach the United States. Um, uh, but this was, uh, frankly, uh, uh, a bold and, and step, uh, a bold and important step by the Prime Minister uh, of Iraq. Uh, we appreciate his positive engagement on this issue, um, and obviously, uh, uh, it reinforces. Uh, the strong collaboration we already have with Iraq uh, with respect to uh, the effort to destroy ISIS uh, on the ground in Iraq. Um, so uh, uh, I think it speaks to uh, the growing uh, ties between our two countries, the growing ability to uh, work together on these kinds of issues, that they were able to, uh, in fairly quick fashion, address some of the concerns that we had uh, with regard to betting. One more on the uh, on the budget issue. Sure. Um, in his Senate testimony, Secretary Tillerson said that he had looked at the org charts and seen a few more dotted lines, a few boxes that. I'm sorry, what are we talking about? I, I missed the first part. On budget. Um, oh, got it. Okay. So he he had said that he'd seen a few more dotted lines and a few more boxes that 
had not been there previously and, and suggest those should be eliminated. So regardless of what the top line budget figure would be, 37% or not, does he support some form of uh, budget cuts to this building and d does he feel that, that the State Department needs to be slimmed down? I, I think I would answer that, Nick, is that he's looking like any um, uh, new leader of an organization as big as the State Department, uh, although we're not that big in the world of <laughs> federal agencies, but uh, it's a sizable organization, is where efficiencies can be found, uh, where there might be duplication of efforts. I mean, let's face it, the State Department um, uh, uh, operates uh, uh, on a fairly uh, um, uh, modest budget in, in the grand scheme of things. So I think, uh, you know, as an effective leader and manager of the State Department of U.S. foreign policy, he's looking for uh, where efficiencies can be found and, and where uh, uh, we can, if, if needed, uh, change or eliminate positions, but also focus on other priorities or focus efforts on uh, um, other goals and, uh, and, uh, and, and actions that we can take in policies. What are those, what are those priorities? This theme, of John, John. this theme of State Department drift, it also derives from a lack of appointments. State Department? A, a drift, a yep. lack, you know, lack of vigor. I got it, sorry. Uh, it's also from a lack of appointments. Uh, there's no deputy secretary appointment, undersecretary, assistant secretaries, huge number of ambassadorial vacancies. It's led some people to believe that Tillerson, Tillerson doesn't have the clout uh, to appoint his own people. Uh, is that true? Look, John, this is, again, I think, you know, this is where, um, and many of you in this room have, have been around. This is not your first transition, <laughs> as we would say, um, and it's not mine either. Um, <laughs> um, uh, um, so I would caution everybody. I'd say take a deep breath because, you know, this is always an ongoing process. And, um, we're working at identifying uh, candidates. I can assure uh, you all, I can assure the American public that we're working on identifying uh, qualified candidates for senior department uh, positions uh, and trying to fill them as quickly as possible. Um, we're also vetting them, and that's part of this process that we do internally. Uh, and then once we have these individuals ready, vetted, uh, then we can go uh, take them to the Senate for their advice and consent. So this process is ongoing. We're identifying people uh, for senior management jobs and senior leadership positions. But I think it's also important to stress that there's a very capable um, diplomatic corps and civil service corps within the State Department. And many of these individuals have stepped into acting roles uh, or remained in acting roles uh, in order to provide uh, consistency uh, through the transition. Mark, yeah. Question yeah, sure. On, on the EO. You I, I thought I heard you say that Iraq was removed for both reasons, but because they were also taking steps to address our concerns. Are you saying that they have not yet addressed? No, no, concerns? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give some kind of time, okay. uh, some kind because of. Because if uh, they hadn't addressed, no, 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 why I, they were I taking apologize. Off Thank you for clarifying. Right. No, they, they have taken steps. Okay. Thanks. Mark, that's in the travel ban. Yeah, I'll get to you. Sorry, is it okay? I no, don't of course, think this yeah, This is okay. very weird. But anyway. This is very crowded. Briefing, so <laughs> now I'm doing that I my have, best to manage. Now that I have the floor. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yesterday the administration, in this version of the uh, executive order, yep. to back it up, mentioned these 300 refugees um, who are under investigation. So, can you confirm whether even one of those 300 is from any of the countries that are named in the ban? And and if not, why not even mention that, yes, some of them are from the countries? I, I don't understand why that would be such e – even though these are under investigation, why would sure. naming the country or countries be so sensitive? It's a, it's a valid question. Um, a couple uh, points to make. One is, excuse me, these are uh, individuals under active investigation uh, by the FBI. Uh, so these are people who already uh, have uh, – uh, theoretically have already immigrated uh, to the United States. Uh, so they're not on our radar, so to speak, anymore. Uh, so I can't really speak to uh, uh, what uh, the FBI may be investigating, who they may be investigating, or really provide any details uh, as to where these individuals come from. Um, my understanding, but again, I would, I would refer you to the FBI or to uh, um, DHS uh, for clarity, is that um, these were 300 individuals uh, 
globally speaking, i.e. not from uh, the six uh, countries that were targeted in this particular EO. Uh, they were speaking to 300 active investigations of uh, people who come over uh, as refugees. Sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions on the EO. Um, so to, in order to be taken off this list of six countries uh, whose citizens aren't really allowed to come here, they would have to provide the U.S. with, you know, greater cooperation, greater data sharing. I'm wondering how you expect countries like Syria and Libya that are in the throes of, you know, violent conflict and, you know, may, many of their government functions really aren't functioning. How do you expect those countries to actually comply with that request and therefore does it amount to basically a de facto um, eternal ban? I have a follow-up for that. Sure. Um, so. Uh, recognizing that this is a challenge, um, uh, certainly with respect to uh, Syria, um, since we don't exactly have um, bilateral relationship uh, relations with the, uh, the Syrian government. Um, but um, with respect to Libya, um, there is a nascent um, government in, Syria, in uh, Libya. Um, we recognize, though, uh, that the situation in both Libya and Syria is, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in uh, perpetual crisis. Uh, the security situation in both those countries is dire. Um, that's part of the reason, frankly, why, um, given the fact that within these uh, areas, uh, within these uh, countries, rather, and the borders, we have uh, ISIS and ISIS affiliates uh, and Al-Qaeda uh, affiliates uh, operating. Uh, that we need to be uh, especially vigilant about the individuals that we're uh, admitting from those countries. Uh, I don't want, though, to uh, in any way, as you say, condemn any country to perpetual uh, 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 travel ban. Uh, that's not what this is about. Um, I think with respect to where we can uh, work with the government, however uh, early days it is with respect to Libya especially, uh, we are going to do so uh, with the eventual uh, goal of trying to get uh, the information that we feel we need in order to uh, fully vet uh, these individuals coming to the United States. And then I have a question specifically to Iran. Um, so th the number of people that are affected by this ban, um, Iranians are uh, overly represented, you might say. Like the, I think it's something like over half of the people who would be coming from these six countries are actually coming from Iran or maybe perhaps even more. Yep. Um, this government under both Republican and Democratic administrations under George W. Bush and Barack Obama has sought to engage directly with the Iranian people, um, kind of going around the, gov the Iranian government, which of course has a lot of enmity and animosity um, towards the United States or between those two countries. Um, I'm wondering what you would say the, the message that this ban sends to the Iranian people, especially given that there isn't that kind of violent conflict that you just referred to or, you know, the um, groups like ISIS or these sorts of, like, um, terrorist sure. groups active inside Iran. Um, as you might know yourself from the 2009 protests, it was evident that many of the Iranian people disagree with the actions of their government. And so what exactly does this sort of ban achieve um, when it's, it seems to be preventing Iranians who are well disposed towards the United States from coming into, into the United States? Um, that's a very good question and a couple of points to make on it. First of all is that we always need to be driven by um, the safety and security of the American people. Um, that's not to say that we don't eventually want to see Iran emerge as uh, a constructive global uh, player, regional player. Uh, that's up to the Iranian government, the Iranian leadership to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, frankly, what we've seen uh, in the past uh, months and year, uh, year rather, uh, or so since the, the, they signed the nuclear agreement is, by, uh, is uh, um, continued bad behavior in the region. Uh, by Iranian citizens well, or the Well, Iranian again, government? I mean, this is, again, this is a, a country that is a state sponsor of terror uh, and uh, plays a destabilizing role in the region. Uh, and so, again, when you're looking at a country like that, it's not, this is not about the Iranian people. It's not directed to them. But when you're considering the safety and security of the American people uh, here in the United States, uh, you have to 
uh, hold them in a in a different class. With all due respect, I mean the ban doesn't um, bar IRGC Quds Force members from coming to the United States. Obviously, they're all barred. But well, there are it, other it, sanctions it's, too. They're under it, it's a totally separate category. Your answer doesn't really address the heart of my question, which is, um, you know, banning the, the an entire country and, it, and all of its citizens, when there is a lot of evidence that, A, engaging with the Iranian people has been the policy of this country going back into yeah, the Yeah, but I, I mean, my answer to your question is that this is a country that has shown itself. Uh, the government has. It doesn't, say. but I'm not saying, but it has shown itself capable of um, exporting uh, terrorists and terrorism abroad. As I said, they're a state sponsor of terror. Uh, what they've done in Syria, what they've done elsewhere in the region, uh, frankly, puts them in a class by themselves with respect to uh, what they're capable of. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, those Iranians uh, who uh, may want to come and, and, and visit the United States um, to develop a, a better understanding of the United States or to visit relatives here. But I, I, but let me be very clear about this one more time. No sponsor of terrorism anymore what I'm that the what I'm Iranian saying people is, won't be able to come to this country? No, what I'm saying is that we have legitimate concerns about uh, Iran's actions. I understand there's a difference between what's happening in Libya, what's happening in Syria, and what's happening in Iran. But Iran has... Well, when Iran sponsors foreign terrorism, they use Lebanese foot soldiers. Le Lebanon is not on this list. They send Hezbollah. To conduct these things. So why, why isn't Lebanon on the list? But, they but they've shown Afghans, Afghans again, to Syria. Again, th what they have shown through their behavior is uh, uh, a consistent uh, uh, ability to uh, create chaos, to, sh to sow uh, um, chaos in the region, to create uh, uh, to, or to fund terrorist uh, terrorist activities in the region, and it's because of that. Uh, that they're under, uh, that they're in this category. Well, but, Do you but think the Iranian saying... government regrets that uh, the United States is now banning its citizens from coming to study in America and meet Americans? Do you think, I, they, I, I do you think, the, the, do you think you've struck, struck a blow against the terror sponsoring Iranian regime by imposing this? No, ban? David, I'm, uh, let me just revisit this. Uh, my point about all of this is, I understand the power of people-to-people -people exchanges and having Iranians come to this country and experience this country and the cultural exchange that that entails and the broader goodwill that that can build. But I think before all of that, we have to put the safety and security of the American people. And it's because of that that they would been put in, uh, they've been added to this list. So, one, so yeah, so one last so question, because we got a lot of questions I, in the room. I mean, I still don't feel like you've addressed the heart of my question. Um, I was at Dulles when a lot of these people were barred from coming in, and then they were eventually let out. The vast majority of them were Iranian, and they were not people who expressed a great uh, affinity with the Iranian government. What I'm saying is that um, your your answer to the question is, is, I think, presuming that the people who are coming here, who are Iranians, are somehow affiliated with the Iranian government or are carrying out their policy? I'm wondering if Not that, at all. No, I, I'm, and I'm sorry if I'm not explaining that clearly. What I'm trying to say is that the government, their government, unfortunately, uh, is a bad actor Does in the, the region. Does the U.S. now equate all the citizens of a country with the, with a bad acting No, government? but what we do uh, take under consideration through this executive order is the fact that, um, that we don't believe uh, that we can ensure uh, the safety of the American people and security of the American people absolutely um, given uh, the current uh, procedures and, and vetting procedures that we have with people coming from Iran. So are you saying that until Iran is not a bad actor, in your words, no, any, I think can that, I finish my question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Are you saying that until Iran is not a state sponsor of terrorism or cleans up its act in the region or you have, you know, less fears about the actions of the Iranian government, that all of the citizens of Iran will not be able to come here? Or are you saying that they need better vetting procedures? Because they're two different things. One is vetting procedures, and one is saying it's a bad government, therefore we're not letting their citizens in. So my answer to that is part of this review period is looking at uh, where we don't have sufficient vetting procedures in place. What are those countries? And then following up on that, uh, well, then, uh, where we can or able to uh, talk to those governments 
and express uh, where there are these disconnects or these failings. Talk to the government of Iran to help strengthen those vetting procedures. Uh, I, I can't speak to that at this time. There's a Homeland Security report uh, published last week that says that extreme vetting procedures are not helpful because people do not become radicalized when they arrive here. They are radicalized years, if not decades later, uh, which undercuts the whole premise of keeping out people from many of these countries. Well, again, I would, uh, I would refer you to the DHS to speak to the contents of their report and the substance of their report. I think what this EO is focused on and where the State Department is focused on in implementing this executive order is on um, looking at how people are vetted from given countries and whether those procedures can guarantee to the degree, uh, recognizing that we can never have 100 percent guarantee, to the degree possible uh, that these people coming in are coming here uh, uh, without the intention to harm, do harm to the American people. Do you have reports from your embassies and, as to how these executive orders, the first one and even the second one, are hurting the United States abroad with allies as well as Adrian, I would, I would say that we've heard it, we've gotten a variety of opinions uh, uh, from a variety of governments from a variety of countries uh, about uh, these uh, executive orders and not all of them negative um, but I think again we need to start from and the Secretary Tillerson spoke to this in his remarks yesterday we need to start from the premise here which is we're doing this we're undertaking this effort in order to guarantee as much as possible of the safety and security of the American people. Uh, and we hope that other governments, foreign governments, uh, uh, can appreciate uh, that premise and take it under consideration. There is but, no underlying threat that's ever been established by any, any agency of this government involving these countries in particular or recent terror activities from their citizens. Again, uh, we can go into the, the criteria, but it's all laid out in the EO of why these six uh, specific countries were chosen uh, to be uh, part of this executive order. Please. Can you speak uh, briefly about, about um, why Syria was taken off a list of being banned independently um, on its – like why they're now going to not be indefinitely kept out of the U.S., Syrians? Refugees. Refugees, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. It was like uh, so Syrian refugees. Definitely. The second version uh, just includes them in the general refugee. Right. right. Um, I, I'm, I'm frankly not, uh, uh, not certain why the rationale uh, to put to shift them, other than that, um, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, they're uh, a segment of the refugee population that's in dire need of, uh, uh, of support. Uh, but uh, I don't have any specifics as, as to why they were taken, moved from one list to the other. I'll try to get back to that. Are we done with? Are we done with the EO? Can we move on to a, a different subject? And then I only have about five more minutes. So, let's. Are we? Are we ready to switch to China? Are we done with it? Okay, I'll go to you and then you, Nike. Okay, Mark, on China, real quickly. Um, you mentioned that the that Secretary Tillerson would bring with him a message of stronger implementation of current sanctions. Is the United States willing to go beyond asking China to confront North Korea? beyond implementation or beyond sanctions, uh, and in particular, there was a Wall Street Journal report out last week saying that the United States was putting greater weight on uh, a military or regime change option. Is that something that the Secretary is aware of or will be discussing in China? Well, look, um, I, I don't want to get into uh, specifics of all the options that we're looking at with respect to uh, North Korea. Um, how I would answer your question is, uh, that we are very concerned with the escalation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, North Korea's actions, uh, the continuing testing uh, and augmenting of its, uh, of its weapons program uh, is of great concern. Um, and it's getting to the point where uh, we need to do – we do need to look at other alternatives, and that's part of what this trip is about, um, that we're going to talk to our allies and partners in the region uh, to try to generate uh, – new approach to uh, North Korea. Um, I, I think right now we're focused on, on sanctions and implementing those sanctions uh, to the fullest extent possible. Uh, but we're looking at other uh, possibilities as well. We always are. Please, in the back, Nike, Nike, and then two more questions after that. Please, Nike. Mark, thank you very much. You said that part of the uh, goal of this travel is to generate new approach in dealing with the DPRK. Does that include direct or indirect 
diplomatic engagement with DPRK. And then could you please update the status of the policy review regarding North Korea? Thank you. Well, again, Nike, I would say that uh, given uh, North Korea's uh, recent behavior, um, we're not at the point where we're looking at uh, direct engagement with them. Uh, we're not rewarding that behavior uh, in any way, shape, or form. I think what uh, North Korea's, and this is something we need to, God bless you, uh, we need to convey to them uh, in very clear terms is that this kind of behavior is only further alienating them from the international community and from the global uh, community. Um, they're increasingly becoming a pariah uh, through this kind of behavior that violates uh, the international norms and international law. And uh, how we convey that to them, how we get that message across to them, uh, remains to be seen. We're pursuing tougher and tougher sanctions, um, but uh, we're also looking at other uh, means to uh, make that message clear to them. Well, Dimitri, what please. What is the Dimitri. future? And recently, uh, China National People's Congress spokeswoman Fu Ying said the mainstream of China-U.S. Um, relationship is cooperation, and China uh, top legislature will continue exchanges with U.S. Congress uh, this year to boost understanding and communication. So what is your um, comments on her, I mean, uh, remarks, and how do you see U.S.-China relations, especially during Trump administration? Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think uh, China is an absolutely vital relationship, uh, relationship with, uh, for the United States. Um, we want to build a more constructive relationship uh, with China. As I said, uh, Secretary's, uh, two of Secretary Tillerson's uh, earliest meetings were with uh, your foreign minister or China's foreign minister and, uh, and, uh, and state counselor. Uh, I, I, and indeed, one of his uh, uh, very first trips is to Beijing. Uh, I think that speaks to uh, the importance that the United States places on its relationship with China. Um, and we're going to look for uh, areas that we can expand our cooperation, uh, whether it's economic, uh, whether it's um, uh, with respect to uh, North Korea or other uh, multilateral issues. Uh, I think we want to build on, uh, our, uh, on our relationship with China. China policy. As for the one China policy, uh, President Trump opposed one China policy. So, how do you think? How There's no change to our longstanding policy uh, on cross strait issues. Um, I think the Secretary Tillerson spoke to that in his hearing uh, in the Senate, uh, and President Trump agreed to in his uh, phone call in February, I think February 9th, uh, uh, with President Xi, uh, that he agreed to honor our one China policy. La last question, I really, guys. It's been an hour already. One on Turkey, and that's Turkey. it. I want to Turkey ask and Dimitri, and then I'm finished. Okay, and Michelle Kellerman. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about Dimitri, American. Michelle. I want to ask you about an American citizen. His name is uh, a pastor. His name is Andrew Brunson. He was detained in Turkey on October 7th um, as a threat to national security. He was held in uh, detained for 64 days without explanation or charge, and officially charged with membership in an armed terrorist organization. Um, on December 9th. I'd like to know um, what the State Department is doing um, about his release. Is there any concern about the case? It seems that this is a, a Christian pastor who has been living in Turkey uh, for 23 years. I'm not sure really what the terrorist charge is. Yeah, and before um, you say anything about privacy concerns, I have the Privacy Act <laughs> right here, and all, it's signed by Mr. Brunson. Does he and check the media uh, box? It, it, the media box is checked, yes. As well That's as impressive. the general public, employer, individual members of Congress, friends, and family. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. That's a that's a that's a first. You've got to be feeling pretty. You've got to be feeling so. pretty good about that. <laughs> I do actually. Yes. Um, uh, we are, of course, aware of U.S. citizens that have been detained in Turkey, and in, indeed, uh, this case in particular. Um, I'll, I'll try to see what additional information I can get, but of course we take very seriously uh, uh, this case and all cases of detained Americans overseas. Um, we're uh, obviously we would offer all consular assistance to any individual who's being detained. Um, uh, I think I could speak more broadly uh, whether you think that he as a Christian or that Christians are being uh, persecuted. The U.S. Christian community is persecuting, or rather, the Turkish government is persecuting the U.S. Uh, Christian community in Turkey, uh, I would not agree with, uh, we would not agree with that assessment. 
Uh, we've seen no clear evidence that Christians are being specifically targeted for the religious beliefs. Uh, but of course, uh, the United States obviously strongly supports the right of all people in Turkey to exercise their freedom of religion and belief. Uh, and in Washington and Ankara, we uh, regularly engage the Turkish government at all levels on the need to respect uh, religious freedom. Um, but with respect to this particular case, uh, given that he has signed a Privacy Act waiver, no, I'll try he, to get you. He signed a Privacy Act waiver. I said, means, yeah. given that he has signed a Privacy Act waiver, which apparently is news to our consular affairs folks. Uh, um, uh, so I'll get you. Uh, I'll get you some more information um, about that. He seems to be wrapped up in this. Like he, they seem to be targeting him yeah. as part of this Gulenist movement. I'm aware he of that. He maintains that he is not part of this movement. So, given the fact that the government, this government in the past anyway has voiced concern about the kind of wide swath which the Turkish government has rounded up people that they believe to be part of this movement. Of course. The fact that an American citizen is being charged. Um, Absolutely. And let me just be very clear that in the case of any American citizen charged overseas that we offer uh, uh, assistance, uh, we offer protections, uh, we, uh, uh, we follow the case, uh, we offer legal uh, assistance where we can or offer them uh, uh, um, uh, access to legal counsel or access to legal assistance. Uh, we uh, visit them in, uh, in the detention facilities that they're being held with, held in uh, to assess their health and to assess their well-being. All of this, I can assure you, is being done in this particular case. But what I don't have is a specific answer to the uh, charges against them, and I'll try to get that for Thank you. Thank you. Dimitri. Great to see you, sir. Good to see you, too, man. Uh, welcome back. Thanks. Listen, I believe I have a very simple question. Of course. At least I believe so. Uh, <laughs> has there been a discussion between the State Department and the Russian Foreign Ministry on the, on the possibility of secret, Secretary Tillerson trip to Moscow or extending an invitation to Foreign Minister Lavrov to travel here in, a, in the near future, I mean? Yeah. No. Um, uh, I don't have anything to announce in that regard, um, I, and I'm not aware of any travel plans uh, at this time. And I don't mean to give you a kind of schmushy answer like that, but that's just where we stand. Instead of that, can schmushy. you give me It's a very technical <laughs> term, yes. Instead of that, can you give me a, a readout of the uh, Secretary Tillerson and Minister Klimkin uh, meeting? Sure. Uh, it, was, uh, it was, of course, uh, uh, focused uh, on uh, 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 Obviously, uh, domestic issues within Ukraine, but also um, our continued concern about uh, compliance with uh, Minsk. Uh, but it was a good meeting. Uh, they talked about reform efforts uh, underway by the uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, and they talked about, uh, and certainly Secretary Tillerson uh, reiterated the U.S. strong commitment uh, to Ukraine uh, uh, and our commitment to ensuring that uh, all sides uh, fulfill their minced commitments, and that includes Russia. So the Ukrainian readout of this meeting uh, says that um, Secretary Tillerson emphasized that the U.S. would further support Ukraine and the U.S. sanctions against the Russian Federation will stay in force until the Minsk agreements are fully implemented, the aggression is ceased, the Donbass and the Crimea are de-occupied. Would you say that that's, a, that's also accurate? I, I can say that, uh, indeed, uh, that uh, with respect to the sanctions remaining in place until uh, Russia complies, um, uh, both with respect to eastern Ukraine but also with respect to uh, uh, Crimea, uh, that that holds true. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, the, yesterday, the White House put out a statement um, about ExxonMobil just an hour or so after Tillerson met with um, President Trump, and I'm wondering if that was part of his discussions or reason for being over there? Uh, not to my understanding at all. I, I believe it was uh, to talk about uh, uh, foreign policy issues and not uh, ExxonMobil. I, I can check, but I Was the Secretary I, I surprised at that? Was that coordinated? Um, I, again, I'm just not aware that, they, that he was consulted on that at all. Can you, can you I mean, I mean, he is yeah, I was actually going to uh, speak to that. I mean, he is, um, you know, uh, as he made clear in his uh, testimony to Congress, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's committed to federal ethics rules, uh, and he's continuing to uh, carry out and meet the terms of this agreement. So uh, he, I think he has until yet. May 2nd, I believe, to, to fully divest. And he, that's the same. Um, guys, last question. Quick, this yeah. is truly the last question. Yeah. I've been up what here are, for over an hour. What are U.S. One-China policy included now? <laughs> 
I'm sorry, what's that again? What are U.S. one-China policy included now? Because why I'm, why I'm asking is because during Secretary Tillerson's nomination hearing, he said, I quote, I think it's important that Taiwan knows we are going to live up to the commitment under the Taiwan Relation Act and the six issue accord. Six issue accord normally we acknowledge is like the six assurance. I just wondering that is six assurance play any role in US one China policy under Trump administration now? Well, again, I, I, I think it is the same one China policy that we had in the past. Um, and uh, there's no change to uh, our policy with respect to cross strait issues. Um, uh, we do encourage the uh, authorities both in Beijing and Taipei to engage in constructive dialogue uh, to seek a peaceful resolution of differences that are acceptable to the people of both sides uh, of the Taiwan Strait. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Thanks everyone. See you again. <laughs> um, uh, sure, I think we're going to do tomorrow is going to be a telephonic briefing, and then we'll, uh, tomorrow's on camera, and then uh, Thursday will be by telephone. So you'll see me tomorrow. Thanks, guys.